Mishnah and the place of the Pirkei Avot in the Mishnah. And the first Mishnah is very heavy on the history, so we'll, we'll begin there. So first of all, as you know, and we've discussed this many times in our group here, that the Torah, that both a oral and written Torah were given. The oral Torah is certain things that are not written in the Torah and a system of interpretation. The oral tradition was handed down by the Zakadim, the elders, e.g. the sages of the community as a whole, and in particular, the authority over what was included in this body of knowledge was the Sanhedrin. There were times of, of spiritual flourishing where things were added to. There are th- times of spiritual downfall where many things were forgotten, but that's where the principles of interpretation come in. They can enable you to restore what is forgotten as long as you have the core material. This was the way, and, uh, and we can talk about it more another time. I think it's quite well known by now that preliterate societies, societies do not rely on writing, People are capable of remembering enormous amounts of material extremely accurately with no changes whatsoever over thousands of years. This has been proven. Ethnologists have seen this. Um, it, for some reason, people in the academic world of Judaic studies are unwilling to make the connection between Solomon Islanders, Himalayan tribesmen, and Jews. Somehow Solomon Islanders with bones through their nose who eat people can manage it, but Jews cannot manage it. But this this is a problem with the underlying... Um, prejudices that infect the academic study of Judaism, and that's just the way it is. So, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, next, uh, the next point to understand is that, that such a body of knowledge is only preserved when you, have, uh, when you have two things. You have a large group of people who produce the experts, as the Gemara says that, you know, a thousand go into Mishnah and one emerges as a teacher fit to sit on the Sanhedrin. A thousand children go into learning Chumash and only one, you know, only one emerges as someone fitting to sit on the Sanhedrin. Uh, you need a big base and if you don't have, even though the members of the Sanhedrin lived all over Israel, but once you have something like the destruction of the Temple and you no longer have sages living in it was, the Jewish community was, uh, was in three places, Israel, Egypt, and Babylonia, and Iraq. Once that changed, that meant that people had no access to the Torah at all, to the extent that even in Babylonia, um, people had completely forgotten that there's a prohibition against eating milk with meat. That's how quickly, when Rav came to Babylonia, he came to a village where, a city actually, significant Jewish community, where no one knew that you don't eat meat and milk together, because ignorance... Uh, propagates rapidly in the app. Because Judaism is such a intricate, detailed, law-based religion, it doesn't survive well if there's no one who knows the law. In other words, um, in other words, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, uh, etc. do fine in the presence of ignorance. They, perhaps they even flourish in its presence. But for Judaism... Uh, you know, ignorance is is, a, is 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 deadly poison, because Judaism is based on on you know every child as they grow up and crying an incredible amount of information as to the do's and the don'ts and and what you believe in the history and so on and so forth. In other words, there's really no point in in Pesach, as if it were, if you don't know you know the history that's behind it and so on. You can imagine. Uh, that Pesach would be meaningless to someone who either can't read the Haggadah or, or doesn't remember it by heart. So, uh, so that being said, even though there is a biblical and implied biblical prohibition against writing down for public consumption the teachings of the oral law, and the advantage, of course, is that way that we don't pay attention to anyone but a certified member of the Sanhedrin was the right to interpret it. There's no book, and the person's the book, so the person's uh, veracity is everything, Right? That's all there is. Just that person's veracity. That's the, the person's, uh, you know, the bona fides are the only thing to rely on. However, uh, that being said, the problem emerged later that with the destruction of the temple and the scattering of the Jews, there were many Jewish communities who had no information at all. 
So Rabbi Yudah Nasi said, look, that to save the Torah, we have to break a detail of it. And therefore, we're going to have to um, write the Torah down, and the oral Torah down. Now, even though various other bits were written down later, the Midrashim, which are the systems of interpretation of the Torah, Rabbi Yudah Nasi created a, or adapted, a, a conceptual order. You know, there are six orders to the Mishnah. Uh, dealing with agriculture, the holidays, marriage and divorce, uh, monetary law, um, monetary law, um, the laws pertaining to the temple, and the laws pertaining to ritual purity and impurity. Those are the six orders. Um, he also uh, basically, out of all the material from the, of, that had been transmitted through the Tanayim, through the basically the rabbis who came from about 50 before the Common Era. So about a, since he did this about 200, about a 250-year period. Uh, so he, put, he wrote a book, essentially, that contained all the key laws of Judaism without which Judaism cannot survive, as well as some of the important dissenting opinions. Why he included dissenting opinions is an entirely different discussion. Um, interestingly enough, in our chapter, there are no dissenting opinions, but that's because there's no laws in our tractate. So in doing so, he created a lifeboat. He created a core set of laws that Judaism could be restored from at any time. Now, obviously, since they need interpretation, they might not be restored the same way by everyone. Interestingly enough, since the discussion of the Talmud began right away, the discussions that became the Talmud became right away, and both Talmuds were written down, there actually wasn't any communities we know of who had to rely on the Mishnah alone. But there may have been, we just don't know about them. But at any rate, the Mishnah was designed to be memorized. It's a big book, but not a terribly big book, the, the six volumes without commentary. And it was designed to be memorized so there would be a text that people would memorize then pass on to the next person. Because books were rare, and in the absence of relational databases, the only way to remember anything and its connection to others is to have the whole thing in your memory. So the Mishnah was, a, and that's there are many aspects of the Mishnah, as we, as those who come to the Talmud class go, know that are designed for for memorization uh, rather than rather than for the ultimate clarity as prose. In the sense, there is a certain degree of poetics in the way the Mishnah is designed. So there are all the tractates of the Mishnah. There are 61 tractates in six orders. Originally, there were 60 tractates. Um, actually, 62. The, originally, there were 60. But, um, but the tr- there was a very big tractate called Nzik and Damages that was divided into three. The first gate, Baba Kama. The middle gate, Baba Metziah, Baba Batra, which we study Sunday morning, the last gate. Now, as you know, we're not meeting the next two Sunday mornings. We have an academic on the 21st. There is an academic symposium for the Sine Scholars. This is this, this, uh, this uh, college student um, study program that involves a stipend and writing a paper. So the winning papers are invited to New York to, to uh, defend their papers in front of a panel, uh, of which one member of that panel is yours truly. Um, and this Sunday is the 20th anniversary of the 20th yard site of Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, who was, as you know, from here. So there is a retrospective, um, which I was fortunate enough to get tickets to. Most people are logging in online, but I figured I would go and, I assume, meet interesting people and, uh, you know, and do honor to a very important figure of the Jewish world. So, um, in, in the past centuries. So anyway, so that's where I'll be this Sunday. And next Sunday I'll be at this. So then afterwards we'll begin. But at any rate, as you know from the, as you know from the Talmud class, uh, the, there are three gates. Uh, and uh, so the 50, the 60 became 62. Then another one got combined, so we end up with 61. So another, there were two that got combined into one. So at any rate, be that as it may, the, there is one tractate that doesn't deal with any laws whatsoever, and that is the one that we're discussing, the one we study between Pesach and Shavuot, or, if you're Ashkenazic, all summer. 
And it is called Pirkei Avot. Now, you commonly know Pirkei Avot is ethics of our fathers, right? And what does ethics of our fathers mean? You know, that because it's the, you know, there's the list of, tra- at the beginning of the book, there's a list of transmission, right? And, and in general, the earlier chapters all follow teacher to student, teacher to student. And it's the chapters organized not by topic, because they're not organized by topic, except really for the fourth and fifth. The sixth is Brita. It's non mishnaic material added later. Um, but uh, So it's organized by teacher to student, teacher to student. But another interpretation that rings better with me is Pirkei Avot, which means to say the chapters an Av we know from the laws of Shabbat and the laws of, of torts, of damages. An Av means a primary principle, a, you know, a, a, a first principle. So you have... Avot and Tuldot, first principles and secondary principles. So Perkei Avot means the chapters on primary principles, because these are the primary ethical and philosophical ideas that drive Judaism. So, for example, Perkei Avot speaks explicitly about concepts of life after death. It, it speaks explicitly um, about uh, about uh, the about the the motivation and purpose behind the t- study of Torah. It speaks about the nature of law, and it speaks about the nature of how we how we ought to live in this world. So it is the underlying um, matrix, the underlying foundation upon which we build Judaism. So that is uh, now a, there. Maimonides makes the point that Pekei Avot is connected to Sanhedrin and the like because. All the character traits and moral directives in Pirkei Avot are especially relevant to judges. Some are indeed only relevant to judges. But many of the statements are, of course, relevant to everyone. Okay. So let us begin. So those who have the book, have the book. You have a sitter in the car? Right, okay. But we're not going to carve so much, and uh, so that's fine. So we begin, there's a, we begin With a with a little bit of Sanhedrin that says Kol Yisrael Yeshlam Chelak Olam Haba, every single Jew, chapter one, has a portion in the world to come. Shunam Avame Kulin Tzadikim, my people are all righteous. Lo Lam Yirshu Aretz. It's for the beginning. This is from Sanhedrin. It's the piece we read before we begin the Mishnah. They will all inherit the world. There are a, a cutting of my planting. I, they are my handiwork to be proud of. And the point, of course, is that um, that essentially we're saying um, that the way, the path to the world to come is through the ideas found in this mission. So, you want the... Uh, okay, I don't need it. I have this. I don't need it. I, no, no, I don't need it. I, 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 I have all the. I have the commentaries in the phone, but it will. Wait, no, but I'm saying, but I have right here. You don't have to. No, someone calls the phone. The ringer is off. You don't have to pick it up. No, no, no. If someone calls, I ignore it. I mean, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to save anyone's life. Uh, at the moment, I can save their life later. You know what I mean. Um, well, so if you want, it depends what, what if you want it with English, uh, Chabad.org has it with English. English is fine. Yeah, so Chabad.org has it with English, yeah. If you want a, he- a whole bunch of Hebrew books, you go to, you, you download the Lech app. Anyways. Can I ask a question? Uh, you, you mentioned the reluctance or uh, biblical... Uh, Injunction. Uh, to not write down the oral law. There was a, is there any similarity between this and the reluctance to write down the 
come here and uh, sort of to, to change the one-on-one. Well, that's exactly... The Hasidim didn't, didn't want to change the one-on-one relationship. The Alt Reb insisted on it in the end. But he didn't want to publish it because he felt it should be handed out. It should be handed out and copied by... In other words, you ought to care about it enough to copy it down, not just to buy a book and put it on the shelf. But once you got a lot of copyist errors and deliberate errors, he changed his mind. So it's related, though not exactly the same reason. But of course, the moment that the Mishnah was written down, anyone, including ignorant people, are capable of reading it and making their own statements. It is a danger. There is the danger of, of misapplication any time you write something down. The same problem with the Internet. You know, the more accessible something is, the more, the more likely it is to be misused. Moshe Kibil Torah Messinai. So the, Mish, the first Mishnah Prikiyavos, which gives it its name according to some, is that Moses received the Torah at Sinai, Umisarali Yeshua, and he handed it to Yeshua. Yeshua is a Canaan, Yeshua to the elders, the Canaan, the Nevi'im, the elders to the prophets, the Nevi'im, Masru Alanchik Nesasegdolan. The prophets gave it over to the men of the great assembly. Now, before I go through the history, we should address a basic question as to why, unlike every other Mishnah in existence, I mean, this order of transmission is well known. It is the provenance, you know, it's the basis, uh, you know, the same way that if you have a, a work of art that isn't signed, you have something like, you know, like porcelain or, you know, anything that isn't signed, it relies on the provenance, you know, that you know that this particular, you know, this particular you know, cup uh, came from China or was in Louis XIV's uh, palace and so on. Uh, the provenance, in other words, the idea that these ideas have been transmitted from generation to generation is crucial to Judaism. It's implied in all of the Torah. Why do we articulate it here? So the standard answer, which has a lot of merit in my opinion, given by many commentaries, is that since we're dealing here with ethics, and ethics are, the, are things that are, are intuitive. Many ethics are intuitive. Many ethics are reasonable. So one might imagine that these ethical, that the ethical principles articulated here all were created by wise men, that the rabbis came up with them based on their experience and so on. So we say, no, what is our, whatever ethics are being quoted in Pirkei Avot are based on our understanding of the Torah that they're not ethics based on human intellect, which can be flawed, or more importantly, they could be relevant in some times and not in places and not others. They can't, they're part of the Torah, they ultimately come from Hashem. Therefore, whatever ethics we articulate here represent, the, uh, represent our understanding of the ethics God gave us in the Torah rather than merely uh, the convenient ethics the, and the logical ethics of the social contract or otherwise. Uh, that one would think of. Okay, that's the first step. Next. It's also true that this is in itself an ethical matter. In other words, if we understand that even things that are not directly halachic are part of a long tradition going back to Moshe at Harsinai. Before we dismiss anything the sages say is no longer relevant, we should think long and hard, because even the things they spoke about that are not the direct transmission of the laws and the like and the rituals tend to be based on something Moshe received from God. <laughs> Joshua, we know who he is. The elders are basically all the all those who transmitted Jewish law till Shmuel the prophet, from Shmuel through the through Jeremiah through the destruction of the first temple, is the prophets. The elders, uh, the and the men of the great assembly were students of Jeremiah's students, Baruch ben Neraya, um, and Mordechai from the Purim story. And though the students of those people became the men of the great assembly. They're called the great assembly because they gathered in Israel 
and among other things, they created the synagogue service and many other things. They interpreted the Torah. They created fences around the Torah, as we'll see. They built, uh, they built rabbinic Judaism as we know it today. Um, uh, so this is from approximately the fir- when they first came back to the land of Israel, approximately 400 BCE to about 300. Now, Ruvain Margoliot, um, who is a very significant scholar, he lived in Israel, uh, was was uh, what he you know uh, was already a, quite a, a prodigy as a young man before the war. Um, Ruvain Margoliot's scholarship basically consists of uh, of bringing together the worlds of traditional rabbinic scholarship and academic scholarship. So he asks his academic questions and uses academic systems to answer them, but at the same time starts with the premise. Uh, begins with the premise that the rabbinic texts are accurate. In other words, they're describing things accurately. We simply have to understand what they're describing. So Ruvim Bargoliot makes the point um, that the men of the Great Assembly, the 120 men of the Great Assembly, it doesn't. there's no body in Judaism made up of 120. So really, he explains, if you look at the, the era, it lasted over 100 years. So we mean to say that the 71 slots in the Sanhedrin were filled during that century by 120 different people. Because people died, people came on, and so on. There were 120 different people who filled slots on that Sanhedrin. And that, uh, the, t- until, the, until the time of Shimon Tzadik, until the conclusion of the Great Assembly. Again, they, 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 uh, they elucidated, they reinterpreted that which had been forgotten, they enacted things like Torah reading and the laws of Muktzah on Shabbat and many other things. Uh, they regulated the laws of the Ketubot and of, uh, and of women's property uh, rights after death of the husband and so on and so forth. There are a lot of important things. Um, the uh, the fact that the Israeli Knesset is 120 is a product through Magalias as of a mistake that they imagined all 120 sat together, which they did not. Um, but that's something which is uh, it's his hypothesis, right? Because I just recently heard the, somebody who was talking about 120 people in the Great Assembly after returning from Bogal and uh, asked 120 people sitting. Right, so Ruben Magalius argues that there's no, see, he's a Talmudist, he says, there's no halachic model, there's no, there's no model for 120 people to sit together. There's a model, that there might be, there are, uh, there, there are three, well, there are three groups, in, in the court there are three groups of 23 students who sit, in, who sit in front and get to ask questions, but that would make 130, so it doesn't help either. So it's it's un, it's unclear, except Ruvim Magali's hypothesis seems to make the most sense, especially since we have no indication that people lived 120 years from when they entered the Sanhedrin, which would make them 160, 170. There's no indication this was going on any longer at that time. As a matter of a fact, he Ruvim Magali does a brilliant thing. There's a Gemara that says that Rav lived a long time. He lived 100, 400 years. It says the problem is if Rav lived 400 years, that meant that he should have been able to answer questions in the time of Ravashi, the last period of the Talmud, because the, the whole Talmudic period only lasted 300 years, from like 230 to 500, less than 300 years. So he says if Rav was a student of Rebbe, you know, so he had to, you know, so... Uh, so it follows that to live, if he lived 400 years, he would be able to engage in debate with the last generation of Tony this, which of course does not happen. So Ruben Magolius says that the answer to this conundrum is very simple. Originally the Talmud says that unlike Shmuel, who only lived 50 years, Rav lived a long time. He lived Tishim Shana 90 years. So when someone wrote an abbreviation in a, in a text of the Talmud, a copy text, Instead of writing tzaddik, you know, the Hebrew letter, he wrote tishim, tough shin with a little thingy. And someone else took the shin out and just wrote tough with a little thingy. Someone came along and saw tough with a little thingy, the Hebrew letter tough equals 400. So he spelled it out as, as Arba Meyot. And that's how you got to Arba Meyot. And there's a lot of those, you know, understanding 
that they, that sometimes the surviving copies of the Talmud represent a stream of knowledge in the medieval period, maybe three three copies thick in the whole Jewish world. You know, especially for the more obscure tractate. So, but anyway, that's the kind of thing that he does. Uh, quite clever, quite interesting. But anyways, this is his solution because otherwise, there's no indication that anyone lived 130 years uh, as a again as a member of the Sanhedrin. So he says this seems to work better because Shimon and Tzadik is much, much, much later than Ezra and Nehemiah. Many, many years later. What? He lived a long time, but we're talking 90, 100, 120. Rabbi Kiva lived 110 years. We're talking the same kind of long people live today, 120, 130 at the most. Not more than that. So now... So now we so now we know all that. So the men of the great assembly um, are the first people we meet because everyone else appears in the Tanakh, and we don't we don't we don't possess the tradition of what they said. I mean, other than midrashically, not halachically, but from the men of the great assembly because they're only there's only between Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi and the men of the great assembly. There's only about five hundred, only about four to five hundred years, and we have a chain of provenance in the same place going back. We have a chain of provenance. Now, there's a chain of provenance all the way back, but until the men of the basically until the men of the great assembly, everything was simply quoted as this is the law. From the time of Shimon and Tzaddik, things are quoted in the names of individuals, or we have records of the names of the individuals. So Shimon and Tzaddik is nominally the first Tana, the first rabbi quoted by name as an authority in the Mishnah. That's the definition of a Tana. Anyone quoted by name as an authority in the Mishnah. So the very first Tana by definition is Shimon HaTzadik. So Shimon HaTzadik, Hayyim Eshiyari Knesset Sagadola. Shimon HaTzadik was of the leftovers. He was the last of the great assembly. Uh, but before we get to him, let's do... Right. Hey, Marmushloja Devarvis. The people of the great assembly said three things. Have a basun and bedin, be extremely deliberate in your judgment. Va'amidu tamidim harbe, and set up many students. Va'asusi yagla Torah, make offense for the Torah. Those are the, those are the three things that we need to do. Now, um, and now I'm going to turn the floor over to you because I would like to know these three statements. There's one, they're eternal. But to begin with, we should understand the historical context. Why are these three things important to the historical context of the rebuilding of the Second Temple and the Second Commonwealth, the rebuilding of, of a Jewish community and a Jewish country? And let's begin with the first one, which is have a Masun and Be extremely deliberate in judgment. I mean, that's good advice in general. But so why is this so important in the historical context of the men of the Great Assembly. What do you think? Is it because not to, to scare off the people who are not exactly... Right. You have... That's, what, that's a very important answer. You have a lot of people who... You know, who, uh, there's a tremendous amount of ignorance. A lot of people who you know, barely holding on to their sense that they were Jews. You have to rebuild the people. So have a Masun and Bedin, be very deliberate in judgment. Don't be quick to judge people because we can't fault someone who's ignorant and the ignorance was widespread. In other words, in this case, it's really important to be deliberate in judgment because you have to make a distinction between the ignorant and the malicious. And there's a very big difference, halachically. Um... We'll talk about the more general value of each of these things. Hamidu Tamidim Harbe set up many students. This isn't the time for elitism. This isn't the time for throwing all your efforts into a few great people. We need to create a cadre of ordinary people who know their, who know something about Judaism. So make many students. Make sure that every town, every village has men and women who know something. Um, and make offense to the Torah which is all the laws that protect the laws of the Torah. Why is this crucial at this point? In times of widespread ignorance, it's easy to forget everything. 
by building a fence around the Torah and avoiding confusion and making things clear, uh, by not demanding subtle distinctions that people might not know a great deal. That helps. Secondly, building a fence around the Torah, um, which means to say creating laws that make it much harder to break the Torah, uh, but at the same time give us more things to think about, um, is a way of engaging the community. In other words, you end up thinking about Judaism a whole lot more. Those are some of the ideas. On the broader level, being... That's nothing, that's just... That's just someone I used to study with who's constantly sending tweets about how to fix Rhode Island, which doesn't really interest me, but I don't want to take my... Rhode Island. He's from Rhode Island, no? So, but I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want, I want him to feel good that I read his tweets. So, excuse me, the second point, um, so would that be favoring someone like Rabbi Elazar as opposed to Rabbi Gamliel? In terms of, in terms of letting people, yeah, absolutely. People yeah, and and we note that Rabbi Elazar and Gamliel is at another time of disaster after the destruction of the temple, and the question is, am I building up, you know, a small cadre of of an elite, or am I trying to restore knowledge, you know, that had been interrupted for a generation because of the the war? And it's interesting, and it's interesting to note, we're talking about Rabbi Soloveitchik, for all the great rabbis out there, the fact is that post-war Jew, Jewry, post-Holocaust Jewry, has not produced another Soloveitchik, another Rabbi Soloveitchik, another Lubavitcher Rebbe, another Moshe Feinstein, another Chaim Zimmerman, another Yitzhevin, another Cook. If you, the, the giants, the people who the test of time shows to have been those who will be quoted for hundreds of years more, who are capable of truly original thought, who have the respect on the whole of the vast majority of, of people who know something of Jewish scholarship, since there is no, not a single, there are, there are great scholars and brilliant men, there exists, and women, but there exists not any person who could be described as a giant who was born after the war. There are no giants born after the war, not one. Why do you think that is? So this is I, what I believe the case is, that in the pre-war Europe, the entire system was designed not to produce a lot of students. Most people went to work at 15. It was designed to cultivate giants. After the Holocaust, it became necessary to restore Torah. So the goal was to build yeshivot and let everyone in. If you let everyone in, you teach to the middle, and you don't necessarily bring out the, ta- the latent talents. It's also an issue of distraction. In a world with no telephone, with no newspapers, with no, no computers and so on. But the fact is, the fact is also that the system was designed to, in other words, you didn't have a lot of people in the pre-war yeshivot, a few hundred there, a few hundred there. But everyone was of some stature. Um, since the Holocaust, we've devoted ourselves to make, to basically putting everyone in Orthodox communities through yeshivas and day schools. So we've done that admirably, and there are many fine scholars, many great scholars, many people who you would be awed by their brilliance. But a Ramesha Feinstein, a Chazonish for that matter, a a Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, a Chaim Shmulevitz, a Ger Rebbe, a Bavadzha Rebbe, you don't find people like that. You simply don't. What? I'm not saying there can't be one. Yeah, also before the war. I mean, the whole bunch of great rabbis, the Red Zina, I mean, uh, before, you know, before, before the war, they're legion. I'm saying those who survived the war were all born before the war and after them. There's no one quiet like them. But if you have a choice between, you know, giants can always be quoted. But if you don't have a broad knowledge base in a community, it fails, Jewishly. Judaism cannot survive as a religion of the, of how do I put it, of the, of the, 
of the faithful ignorant. In Judaism, faith and knowledge go hand in hand. The Baal Shem Tov praised the ignorant believer, but devoted most of his career to making sure there weren't any ignorant people. As the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe puts it about one of these stories, that the man deserves credit for his piety in spite of his ignorance, but deserves criticism for being ignorant in the first place. Or at least a criticism of the community. Most of the Baal Shem Tov's work was not celebrating the ignorant, but trying to teach them in such a way that they cease to be ignorant. Not a single one of the Baal Shem Tov's students was anything other than a great Talmud scholar. Baal Shem Tov had not a single member of his inner circle who was not a great scholar. But the ultimate goal is, is the is the dissemination of knowledge. If you were really wanted, worried about creating an elite, you wouldn't write, you wouldn't write the Mishnah down. You still have your elite. That's not our goal. The Torah belongs to everyone. And therefore, Vamidu Tamidim Harmony, but especially in times of disaster. Especially in times of trouble. When you need to rebuild the Jewish people. <coughs> Well, yeah, in general, but the Enlightenment and the Zionists, if you look later than the Enlightenment, even you look at the battle for the hearts and minds, and these, those days was primarily men, of young Jewish men, later of, you know, women, you know, um, basically you have... Uh, you have the Enlightenment and you have the Zionist movement and the Bundists and the Communists and the Anarchists and so on, all fighting for the hearts and minds of Jewish young men and later in the century of Jewish young women. On the other side, you have the great yeshivot. Uh, the, the, in 1897, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe founded Tom Chaytimimim, which was his pretty elite yeshiva that was a big one. Um, you know, Sarah Schneer in the early 20th century begins the base Yaakov movement and so on. You have the Chachmei Lublin, the great yeshiva in Poland that unfortunately only functioned about 15 years till the Holocaust. It's now a medical school. Um, all these, uh, you know, you had all these tremendous, but yes, the yeshiva were engaged in a very, in, a, in an intellectual struggle, in a struggle for the minds and uh, of, of yeah, so there's there's no question that uh, and the struggle was over the best and the brightest, you know, um, the lapsed yeshiva bachrim, you know, became uh, you know became the shalom aleichems and the bialiks and the and the shazars and you know and the and and the leshkols and so on. The lapsed yeshiva bachrim became. You know the leaders in Israel and uh, and frankly, you know all over the world. Um, as you know, the, and the ones who stayed in yeshiva in themselves uh, did uh, did great things. Um, but uh, but the, there's also a factor that it's not enough, and this is another thing you see from the chain of transmission. It's not enough to have raw knowledge, raw intellectual ability. One learns as if it were to be a giant from being in the presence of other giants. And yes, all of us saw the Rebbe, but the Rebbe, by definition, was involved with many people. My point being that before the Holocaust, there were so many giants that the next generation had ample time to pour water upon their hands, as the language goes, uh, as Alicia says. They had, they had in, in intimate personal connection with those giants to understand how one becomes a giant. After the Holocaust, there are so few and the demands upon them so great that that doesn't exist. It's another factor. But at any rate, be that as it may, the Pir Kavot says, don't worry about it. When it comes to Jewish learning, when it comes to creating knowledgeable Jews, quantity is quality. In other words, it's far better to have... Uh, 
a community with a hundred learned lay people than with an incredibly great rabbi. Many great rabbis came to the United States, to Sheboygan, Wisconsin, to Mino, North or South Dakota is Mino. North Dakota, to Minor North Dakota, to Santa Barbara, California, to Portland, Maine. But they left nothing behind. They were great scholars. They weren't able to, or didn't have the ear of the younger generation. Uh, what the communities that survived were the ones who had a critical mass of learned lay people. You know. So essentially, the same amount of knowledge divided into a thousand people is always better than having one knowledgeable person who has no one to talk to. One giant is not. So make, make, I mean, tell me them Harvey, make you. Giants are important, but have many students and that issue will take, will take care of itself. After all, Maimonides only comes around once in a thousand years. But there's been millions of people who benefited by studying Maimonides. You can't not have a Maimonides. But you don't need a hundred of them either. So the second principle in the way is, is this part of the basis for Shurkas? The second, yeah. This, and, but more than that, the Rebbe made the point once that the basis for Shlichus, as far as be, the Sanhedrin of the early first, second temple period, is in the Talmud itself, where it says that the men of the, starting with the men of the great assembly, they would put iron chains around their waists, you know. Yeah, yeah, as a way of saying, you know, to strengthen yourself for a long journey. Um, and, uh, and they would, it says they would travel the length and breadth of Israel to see what needed fixing, to find promising students and bring them to Jerusalem to study and so on and so forth. So this idea that you gotta get out and find people is, uh, you know, is, is it the air? And yes, wherever there's wherever there's been a debate, include or not include, the the include is always one. You know, should we have yeshiva for ordinary people? Yeah. Should we teach people the mystical secrets of the Torah? Yeah. Should we teach women like we teach boys? Well, yeah. Whatever there's a question, there's a fight, but the winning side is almost always yeah when it comes to disseminating the Torah. Not necessarily other things. When it comes to disseminating the Torah, the winning side is almost always yes. Which means to say, if you have whatever your misgivings, as long as it's reasonable, if you have a choice between disseminating Torah more widely or less widely, go to the Harbe. So, Harbe, set up many students, means to say, set up as many students as possible. In other words, always set up your students using the Harbe, the many mode, rather than the elitist mode. Last of all, make offense for the Torah. The idea being that uh, the idea being that um, that uh, it's extremely hard not to go over a cliff once you're right on the precipice. So make space so that uh, even if people do transgress, they don't transgress the Torah. More importantly, they make it harder to transgress the Torah because in areas and, and all the ideas of making offense have to do with habit and confusion. Muktza exists because otherwise it's too easy to start using the things prohibited to work with on Shabbat and work with them on Shabbat. You know, um, chicken and milk is not permitted because chicken is too similar to meat in many ways. It is a form of meat. It's just too confusing. Just leave it. Um, you know, uh, if we're concerned that, that, uh, that people might not treat other people's property possibly, so change the laws of property. And so on. And there are many, many examples of this making offense for the Torah. But basically, he said, don't be afraid to make offense for the Torah. Don't be afraid to make new rules if those rules will ensure that the core laws of the Torah are kept. And, me- and I just want to say that many of the rule of the offenses are not to protect the the law itself, but its intent, its meaning, right? So the so we, so we don't travel to we're not allowed to travel outside the Shabbos boundary on Shabbat that Shabbat not become a day of journeying to, to your, towards your work. Um, we uh, um, we we uh, you know we um, 
which in a few examples of we prohibit the discussion of business on Shabbat lest you come to do business. We prohibit making agreements of buying and selling not just because you'll come to write them down but because it's wrong to devote Shabbat to, uh, to one's business even if it isn't involving physical labor. Um, you know, we, uh, we mandate... Uh, we mandate that people give certain gifts to the Kohen and Levi, even in Syria, even outside Israel, so that we not get out of the habit of giving those gifts if we happen to live in Syria. And so on. So there's also, there's two aspects. One is protecting the practical observance, like Muktzah, but the other is also, like Muktzah, protecting the idea of Shabbat, because if you do all the things that are permitted biblically on Shabbat, you can be completely absorbed in your business, and though you didn't break Shabbat technically, you also didn't rest <coughs> from your mundane activities. So, so that... You know, um, Manus Friedman makes the point that the prohibition against being alone in a locked room or a closed room with someone of the opposite gender who is not your who is not a close relative or a permitted person to you um, th- that it's not just that it might lead to sexual misdemeanor but that the act of being alone with someone is in itself an intimacy that puts a person's thoughts in a way it shouldn't be. Again, we're perfectly happy to have men and women interact what we don't want is that that interaction acquire a tinge of illicit behavior. And so on. So, so, but but, this, but this, uh, this fencing of this kind, which is sort of uh, extending the idea of the biblical uh, right. rule, is only possible if we understand the biblical rule. So it's applicable to those laws, I mean, to the... Uh, Versus or even a dot like Shabbat, yeah. right? The only reason to wall around a chok, a practical reason. Yeah, so meat and milk, we we make a wall around it for a practical reason. Sure. In other words, it would be incorrect to say that there's some moral or ethical or spiritual value, right? In um, <laughs> in not eating chicken and milk together because it's a chok that means the value is that God said to do it but rather because it's easy to confuse them because in all their other laws, in blood and slaughter and so on, in trefot, the prohibited diseases, chicken and meat are the same. The only difference halachically between chicken and meat is with regards to milk, and that's too confusing. What was your question? I'm sorry. My question was, I think we started before that uh, Adam uh, told Hawa that you not supposed not only eat from that fruit, but also... Tiger. And got in trouble, and it was a and bad thing. got in trouble, and that was a bad thing. So right, that he made a fence. talking about kind of opposite thing, that when these fans are to- build a fence around the top, so you, you ho- the So you have asked, you have asked a question the Lubavitcher Rebbe asked. You've asked the Lubavitcher Rebbe's question. And he explains like this, that the, that generally speaking, all things being equal in a perfect universe, the goal would be that we positively use everything the Torah permits. Therefore, it's a bad thing to forbid, forbid anything the Torah permits because you want to elevate everything the Torah permitted. So therefore, Adam and Chava, who were born into a perfect world, the only imperfect thing was the snake, it was, it's a bad thing to say, don't eat, don't touch this, don't utilize this, and so on. But once we had the story with the snake, once you have an imperfect world, which means to say you have a world in which we don't always see things clearly, we have a world in which we're subject to the desire to do things wrong, which didn't exist before. So then we need to make sure that we don't fall in that we don't fall into the negative because we have a relationship to the negative. You can't say do everything that's permitted. Because some permitted things are so close to the negative that given our general state of confusion and of subordination to our evil inclination, it's just too easy to fall in. In a perfect world, you go to the line. I mean, it's really, it's really very simple if we take the fence metaphor. You know, um, you know, in broad daylight, 
you know, they, you can walk, you know, a broad daylight, I don't know, you're on vacation, you can walk right to the edge of the pool and put your toes over the edge and nothing's going to happen. But on the other hand, in the, in the pitch black, in the middle of a storm, the last thing, walking across a place where you don't know where the pool is, the last thing you want is for someone not to, not to have a fence around that pool. Because you're going to fall in. You know, um, if you have a, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, if you have a, you know, a, I don't know, some lake in Siberia in the winter, it freezes over, you have nothing to worry about. In Massachusetts, if you have a small pond that freezes over and there's children there, it's a good idea to have a fence around it because you never know when the ice is thin, where it is. But that's the idea. That where we have clear vision, we know exactly where to stop and therefore we have to utilize everything we can. In a world in which we don't see clearly, we need to make sure we're not getting anywhere near the edge because our Yetzirah clouds our vision and makes it unclear to us where the edge is. So before this... so. So, before the sin of the tree of knowledge, it's wrong to add anything at all. And in doing so, that wrong thing, that one sin set the stage for another. The big sin. Once we did the big sin, things are so confusing that we cannot rely on purely the law as it is because we're unlikely to get it right. We're likely to fall in. So we need offense. Mitzvot. There's a the, the, right. So that's something else. You see. You see. You see. You see there. That's another. That's another story. Rabbinic laws, like I don't know the Megillah or something, those are things that existed, but just were not brought down into the Torah. There's a discussion about this about the the Birchat Hamazon. Well, second day of the, of the holiday in, in Galut. Right, but they choir spiritual. Yeah, I mean, but that's a, that that and that is sort of a, that's not offense. No, it's not a fence, it's a doubt. We don't know what day, and now we know what day, we've been practicing it. Making a fence to the Torah is only one kind of rabbinic law. There's rabbinic laws enacted because of doubts, like, like the second day of Yontav. That's not about a fence, you have a 50-50 doubt. <laughs> you, so you have to do Oh, so but then, then, then already it's a day that we've discussed this in the past, that we've sanctified but that's something else. That's sanctifying something. That's not a fence. That's taking something ordinary and making it holy. So, let me ask you, if I eat chicken with milk today, so will I violate... Yes, you will, because the... the ra- law or, or, or not? You didn't violate the Torah law, but you violated the rabbinic law. The rabbis made this fence. The moment they make the fence, you have to keep it, even if it no longer makes sense. So, that means that Hashem... Hashem told us that you shall listen to everything the rabbis tell you. Once the rabbis make a rule and don't change it, that's what Hashem wants. Hashem says, whatever they say, I'm cool with it. What? Hashem can't undo it. Only the rabbis can undo it. Yeah, Hashem... From yeah, it is. Hashem said, do all as they tell you. You need a fence. It is, it is. Hashem says, look, if they say they need a fence, I need the fence too. Okay. So that's becoming like the same... The, the, the Rambam says, there's no difference in Torah law, rabbinic law, except for the fact, to the extent that the rabbis make their laws more lenient. And sometimes the rabbis don't even listen to Hashem. They don't have to. But they not... In other words, the story, he's talking about the story in Gemara where Rebbe Lazar, you know, where, where, where Rebbe Lezer, you know, said that he was right and a heavenly voice agreed with him and the rabbi said, sorry, the heavens not, Torah is not in the heavens, you know. Yeah. Because that's because Hashem commanded us to understand it as best as we can. But the point of the fence is, it's a very specific set of things. The fence is like mukta. Defense is to protect either a law or an ideal. It's a protective measure. Yichud, not being alone with a, you know, with a woman who is prohibited to you or who isn't a close relative. 
Um, in other words, a close relative is not a problem. We assume you don't have a desire for her, and vice versa, a woman with a man. You know, it's obviously the prohibition is on both. But that's designed to avoid adultery, right? Um, and not eating chicken with milk is designed to avoid eating meat and milk together, and so on. Those are fences. Once they're made, they until they're changed, or if they're not changed, they have their own that they have their own strength because Hashem said to listen to them. Do you have any history when they were changed? There is a principle that any law that was made that the community was not able to handle it at the time it was made is nullified. So they know there's a law against non Jewish wine and non Jewish milk. There used to be a law against non Jewish oil, olive oil, which was a staple. But the community never kept it because they couldn't handle it. It was too hard. So the next generation of rabbis, this is around the time of Shimon ben Shatach, who we'll meet later in Pirkei Avot, came to the conclusion that it's null and void because it was a decree the community could not handle. But this nullification by the community only works in the first generation of the law. Because the premise is that if one group of people can keep it, you know, you, the next group can keep it too. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't take it doesn't take a giant, you know, to to keep something simple. Um, what? No, no. Well, the premise is because we're not making any due decrees now. Individual communities have a right to make decrees, and 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 we do and we do say that if some if there is a individual law, rule made in a community and no one keeps it, that principle applies. And there's a famous story that that because you know the, on Pesach we declare as kidneyot that we don't eat anything flour can be made from. So Rabbi, so Rabbi Avram Danziger, the Chaye Adam, lived in. Lithuania in the early, late 18th, early 19th century, decided that potatoes are kidney oat because you can make potato starch from them. So one of the rabbis at the time said, you know, that, that you know, of course no one listened. And he says, of course no one's going to listen because even, as he did a pun, even the chaye adam, chayon means the life of man, even the chaye adam cannot prohibit the chaye adam. Even the life of man cannot prohibit the life of man. Potatoes are the fundamental staple, you know. You can make flour from it. Well, you could make powder that looks like flour from it. Well, that was exactly the point. So no one listened, and that's where this other rabbi said that even the chayyadim cannot prohibit the chayyadim. Right. There's actually a discussion about about um, you know about uh, Akasha, you know about um, you know buckwheat. So there's a discussion. So this, with kidney oat, there's two issues: is something kidney oat, and is a derivative prohibited? So people argue that buckwheat, you know, because you make flour and bread from it, it is kidney oat, and that's the general ruling. That not everyone agreed, but but the the question is, what about they used to make like a beer? From buckwheat, you can ferment anything. We say make a beer from buckwheat. Um, so people used to drink it on Pesach. So most of the authorities said no. It's just like buckwheat; you can't have it. But there's one authority who said, "Well, it's derivative. Since it's a derivative, the rule is that wherever there's a um, an overriding need to do kidney oil, right? The like kidney oil is not prohibited in medicine for Ashkenazi. So he says that the he says that this beer they make has a, has a has a overriding purpose that should make its position as a derivative not forbidden. Again, derivative kidney oil, if you have any good reason why you need it, other than you wanting to eat it, that's sufficient. So he says, so he says that the, the so this is what he writes. He writes, this is a late eighteenth century, that the exile is so bitter, let the sons of Israel drink dr- drink this alcohol and forget about their troubles. <laughs> so it's a medicinal use. <laughs> so, so that's that's an argument against. Uh, but the point is, I mean, there are 
I can think of a range of, of I'll give you another thing that, that went out the window um, and probably was never really kept. The prohibition against music. When the temple was destroyed, there's a prohibition against music. Instrument, no instrumental music is allowed. That's it. So some say, well, that was, wasn't made for a mitzvah. So as long as it involves a wedding, a bar mitzvah, a bris, it's okay. But what about just listening to music? What about just playing music? I don't want to put Yuri out of business. You know, so the answer is, they, they say, is that the community can't handle it. No one expected the exile to be so long, and the exile is so long and bitter, just like the, just like the beer, the people need some music. That's the answer. So there is this idea that does exist, to, you know, to some extent. But the problem is, is that, is that now you come along and say, you know, oh, this is a decree the community can't handle. But the truth is, it's, it's, so for example, you can't say the prohibition against non-Jewish wine is a decree the community can't handle just because most people don't keep it, because most people don't eat kosher either. In other words, where, the, where you have people who are committed, here's the crucial point, and this is, this is the crucial point. Where you have a situation where people are genuinely committed to keeping the Torah and do their best but somehow can't handle one thing. But where the problem lies in a general laxity in the observance of the Torah, that doesn't count. So if genuinely people need music, they need music. They tried, they couldn't do it. And if people need oil and it's too, you know, looking for oil pressed by a Jew is too much, so they need it. But where you have you, a situation where people don't keep anything and they come along and, and people say, well, a majority of people don't keep it. Well, a majority of people don't keep biblical laws that aren't subject to this nullification, right? You can't come along and say that muktzah is too hard. Because a lot of the same people who don't keep muktzah who form a statistic for the majority of the community also don't keep Torah at all. Maybe not their fault, but the fact is they don't keep it. And just the opposite, if it's not their fault, since they don't commit to to keeping rules at all, they don't count in the number of people who, can, who can't handle it. Because can't handling it means you're committed to keeping the Torah, you keep everything. This thing you literally cannot keep. But, it, but any population that isn't exerting every fiber of their being to keep the Torah doesn't count in this number. So mean? therefore, it could be that even if it takes several generations like the story with the music, that it would be nullified, because it was nullified among those who clearly, on the whole, kept Torah and mitzvot. But, uh, but things like the second day of Yontav and the like, the fact that most people don't keep them is a function of the fact that most people don't keep the first day either. So that sort of thing doesn't count. Again, we're not criticizing, we're not saying it's people's fault, they don't know. But, uh, but, but, uh, but ignorance uh, doesn't work. Okay. Does that go more for the community than for the individual? Let's say there's a, a mourner in Avo who can't live without music, or someone who needs music during the Omer period. Is that considered uh, not as valid as a communal thing? Look, the prohibition against music in the Omer period is derived from the prohibition, you know, during the three weeks. You know, if it's genuinely therapeutic, I'm sure we, you know, one could permit such a thing. You know, it's permitted for people who do it for a living to practice, even during the three weeks. Because as well, you know, practicing is anyways a chore, you know. Well, the mourner on the whole is supposed to avoid music. You know, uh, if, in other words, if a reputable, uh, a reputable psychologist says that the music is necessary to avoid some manifestation of mental illness or something, that, that would be fine. But it you know, has to be genuine. In other words, it can't be that it would make me happy. There has to be an actual mental or physical condition that it helps. But in general, rabbinic rules are waved in the face of physical or mental illness, even if it's not dangerous. The only exception is the prohibitions against forbidden relationships, because the human libido is a very powerful thing. 
So there it says that if a person says, you know, I absolutely, you know, I, I, I don't want, you know, I won't do anything. I just want to be alone with this person. I just want to touch this person because I'm smitten with them and it's not an appropriate relationship. So we say, let the person die and let not, uh, let not the, the boundaries of appropriate relationships be, you know, be broken. So, you know. So that, but but that's the exception when it comes to matters of food and music and so on. It's, you know. So, for example, the classic example is when the Jews were expelled from Spain. The rabbis said that even on Tisha B'av, was on Tisha B'av, the even on Tisha B'av, you can play music uh, to keep people's spirits up, so they should be able to keep walking. You know, because they had to walk a long way to the ports and so on. So. Does the prohibition... Be, and, and by the way, the Maimonides explains it's not that the rabbis' prohibitions are, are weaker. It's that they enacted them in such a way that because they enacted them for a purpose, they enacted them in such a way that they should be, that they should be nullified in the presence of any strong reason, such as illness and so on and so forth, or, or sometimes even a great loss. Certain rabbinical laws of Shabbos are waived in the presence of a great financial loss. The idea being that it's a great temptation to overcome. With a biblical law, you have to overcome it, but with a non, with a rabbinic law, we might as well help you, rather than have you transgress. So the idea being that that when you make a law, you want it to be kept. You don't ever want to enact a law that is not kept, and it ceases to have meaning, like speeding laws. The laws against speeding are merely a form of taxation. They have absolutely no uh, moral suasion because no one keeps them. And uh, if no one keeps them, they're not reasonable um, in the way they're applied and so on and so forth. So within reason, uh, you know, uh, the fact is they represent laws enacted and in a way they reduce the respect for law as a whole because, you, you know, there's all, there is a whole set of laws that no one keeps. In other words, stop signs and red lights people tend to keep. Except in Massachusetts. Speeding on? No, I'm pretty good. I don't know. I, you know. I don't see too many people running red lights. Cyclists, yeah, but not like drivers. Anyways. but uh, So that's the Asusi Aglatara. The, 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 there are a lot of factors. And again, they were designed to solve a problem, not create new problems. So... That's that's why there are inherent leniencies built into the into the fence they built around the Torah. Is the prohibition against studying Kabbalah Kabbalah? That wasn't even a fence. That was a particular prohibition for a certain time in a certain place because of certain problems. So after Shabbat Tzvi, it was before, well before Shabbat Tzvi. After Shabbat Tzvi, it was reinforced. And when the Hasidic movement came along, the Baal Shem Tov argued that inasmuch as the problem is that one takes it literally and therefore um, sees God in anthropomorphic terms, if one has uh, a system of, uh, of explanation that avoids this problem, there's no reason not to. That's a decree made for a problem. Talmud says... That we don't learn Talmud, that we don't learn Talmud, we don't learn Torah in depth with women because women are likely to are likely to uh, to uh, dis- to not understand it properly and uh, and end up distorting its meaning because they're not typically trained intellectual activity. Well, it follows that in a generation where women go to school and are trained intellectual activity, there's no reason not to learn Talmud. That was Lubavitcher Rebbe's position as well as Rabbi Soloveitchik's. There's a statement, you know, don't study the Talmud with people who are not likely to grasp it. The general education of women has changed drastically since then. And it's not even since then. You know, by the time you get to the 17th century, there are rabbinic families where the women are habitually taught Talmud and so on. It's merely a function of, uh, of the capabilities. You know, people's capabilities change, you know, and and uh, you know, and and the question is: before it was the norm, why were those families different? Why did those families see fit to break the prohibition? Because they understood, they understood bar none. So what's the issue? 
that the issue is only the danger that someone studies something they're not prepared to understand. If that danger doesn't exist, it's not a problem. There's a biblical prohibition against a non-Jew studying Torah that's not relevant to them. Lubavitch Rebbe pointed out that since the Noahide laws include much of Judaism, that most of the Talmud can be studied by a non-Jew. Right? All the monetary law they can study. They can't study the laws of Shabbat, but they can study monetary law. Um, they can study the laws of Kashrut, because a non-Jew can undertake to keep kosher if he wants to. They can study the laws of sacrifices, because a non-Jew may bring a sacrifice to the temple. Yeah, but I'm saying the point is he can bring a sacrifice to the temple, you know, to be brought by the Kohanim. So there are certain things he needs to know. So that, that by the time you get through it, there's a, a huge amount of material in the Talmud that you could very happily learn with the non-Jew. As well as the material from the Kabbalah, for that matter. So that point right? Well, the idea is, you, the idea is that the... Yeah, but with it, we're saying the point is with the Nisham is that the Torah is not relevant to the soul of, of a non-Jew except what's relevant, but a lot of it is relevant. With regards to the spiritual difference between men and women, I think that expresses itself more in action, more in mitzvahs. Because, for example, there's a, profound, there's a much bigger spiritual difference in the soul of a Kohen and an ordinary Jew than there is between a man and a woman. Right? But you can study the laws of sacrifices. You just can't bring them if you're not a Kohen. So, the primary difference to men and women has to do with, with their souls, has to do with which mitzvot they do. Right? Um, uh, you know, women don't need to put on fill and men don't need to go to the mikveh every month. Or light the Shabbos candle. Well, actually, that's incorrect. Men can light, well, there's no woman in the house, men do light Shabbos candles. When I'm a, when I'm when I'm staying alone alone in a hotel for Shabbos, yeah, and my wife is in a different time zone, I like Shabbos candles. Yes, because the household must have Shabbos candles. But if there's a the difference is that for example, let me give you an example. So if it comes to kiddush, if there's a man and a woman, arguably, the husband should make kiddush. It's not necessarily the case, but arguably, some say. The husband and wife can both make Kiddush. The husband should she can make Kiddush too, but I'm saying one person make it. If there's Shabbat candles to light, the woman should do it. If there's a man and a woman, the woman should do it. A man only lights Shabbat candles in the absence of the woman. And say the same words. Right. So once my wife went out with the went out with the children and it got late, so I lit the Shabbat candles. Because I was unsure whether she would come back in time to light them. But normally she should light them. But for obvious reasons, the mitzvah of mikvah only relates to a woman. Um, you know, but as do, as do, as do certain other things. Um, you, know, um, uh, you know, as do certain sacrifices for childbirth, which you don't bring today. But there's, there are four or five mitzvot that only relate to women, by definition, or by decree. So aside from the uh, festivals, it's a minog. It, it adds purity. It, in other words, it has spiritual value, but it doesn't have any halachic imperative. So well, not just the chassidic world, though. No. But no, no man, no, no man ever has to go to the mikveh except when the temple's standing, and you need to purify yourself to go to the temple. So, but in terms of studying. Well, the only difference is that men are obliged to study Torah every spare moment they have, and women are not. And that has to do with the different spiritual roles. If they want, they could study pretty much everything that, that men Yeah, have. they could. There's another difference. Um, well, it's not really a difference, because men also have to study the practical laws. There is a woman must study the practical laws. A woman must know all the practical laws and all the fundamental principles of Jewish philosophy and belief. A woman must, because those are relevant to, to mitzvot that are relevant to everyone, to know God, to love God, to fear God. 
The general premise is that, the, that there are very few men who know all the things that a woman is required to study. That being said, once you finish those things, so for a woman it is an optional mitzvah, and for a man it's a mandatory mitzvah. That's the difference. But that, that does have to do with the soul root, that the, that the, uh, that the primary obligation uh, of men, once they've done their basic mitzvahs, is in the realm of thought, and the primary obligation of women is the realm of action. But again, the difference is, is somewhat academic, because the amount that one needs to know to fulfill the mitzvot, including the, the, the mysticism and philosophy one must know, is so great that most people never finish it in their lifetime either. But of course, since it's not mandatory, this creates a cultural difference. But my point is there's no actual prohibition today. Men can light candles if there's no woman to light it. Because the lighting candles, you have to understand, the lighting candles is an o- the lighting candles is an obligation of the household. Okay, so this is what we'll conclude for tonight, and uh, shall we continue with Perkei Yes. Okay, so we'll finish the Mishnah next week, maybe even another Mishnah. Sure.